It is a great pleasure to welcome on the show today the philosopher, writer, and mystic Alan Watts. Watts is a philosopher and writer best known for his talks and books on Zen Buddhism, psychedelics, ecology, and spirituality. His writings explore the relationship between meditation, Eastern philosophy, and modern science. Later in his life, he became an Episcopal priest and spent several years as the pastor of the Shaughnessy Church in San Francisco. His books include The Joyous Cosmology, The Book, This Is It, The Wisdom of Insecurity, and most recently, In My Own Way. In this interview, he speaks of the links between science, philosophy, and religion. Welcome, Alan. Thank you. One of the things that I'm most interested in is that you seem to me to be very well informed about the new physics and cosmology, and yet, at the same time, very much a mystic and a philosopher. How does this work? Well, that's quite simple. What people don't understand is that the mystical experience is the basis of science. There can be no science without a mystic experience. Why do you think that science arose in the West and not in the East? Why do you think that the, the philosophy of the East is so barren of any science? Of anything except a kind of mental gymnastics? Because they don't have that experience. They don't have the mystical experience. And you can't do science without it. And yet the mystical experience is not the same thing as science. No, it's the basis of science. Science comes out of the mystical experience. What do you think is the source of science? Goethe said that all the truly great thoughts are conceived by walking. That's why the offices and buildings of great scientists look like the quarters of solitary monks. They're thinking about the universe. What is the universe? Where did it come from? Where is it going? Why is it here? And that's the same kind of question that the mystic asks. The difference is that the mystic, if he's a true mystic, will be able to answer it. He'll be able to say, I know, I've been there. And yet, as I look at the history of science, I see that it began as a branch of philosophy. It began with Plato and Aristotle. Yet today, it's become something so different. I don't see how you can reconcile the two. Well... That's again the fault of the East, because the East said that the senses deceive. Reason is the only path to truth, and therefore they've never developed any science. So science has to be done by people who are not bound by any set of rules. And they've never been able to do it. What's the evidence that the senses deceive? They don't. They're true. I mean, the illusion of the senses. Well, that's because of the way the brain works. The brain looks for patterns. It looks for familiar patterns. You go into a room and it looks for patterns that say it's a room. It doesn't say, no, I don't see any familiar patterns, therefore it's not a room. It sees the floor and the wall and the ceiling and it says, oh yeah, it's a room. Then how do you explain the fact that many ordinary people have mystical experiences? Well, that's because they're not ordinary people. Ordinary people are the ones who go to work who raise the kids, who go to the shopping center, who are very concerned with the everyday practical thing. And you don't become that way unless you're somewhat different. You have to be somewhat different to become a mystic. You're a little different in that you also have an encyclopedic knowledge of science and the history of science. How did that come about? Well, I'm a child of my time. I was born when the atomic age began. I was born in 1914, just at the time Einstein was beginning to formulate the theory of relativity and quantum physics and all the rest. So I grew up with this, and it was really a great adventure, and I've never gotten over it. Would you say that science and mysticism are compatible? Oh yes. Oh yes. I think that if you have a mystical experience, you're a scientist. If you're not a scientist, you're not a mystic. What would be the distinctions between a mystic and a scientist? A scientist is a mystic who is engaged in the attempt to become a good engineer. A mystic is someone who has had a mystical experience and is trying to report on it 
and the two are essentially the same thing. They're just two viewpoints on the same thing. I would say that a scientist is somebody who is able to be in the world and not be of the world, who is able to be with the world, not be of the world. That's a line from Wordsworth. But I think you can do that in a mystical experience. You can be in the world and not be of the world. Yes, I agree. And that's a very important, that the mystic is able to do that. Not just say it, but do it. I agree. But I would also say that a scientist is somebody who is able to be of the world and not be of the world. Well, sure, I mean, a scientist sees the world as it is. But also able to see the world as it isn't. Yes. Well, that's what I mean by a good engineer. A good engineer is somebody who can see what the world is and then make it different. So, in a way, a uh, mystic is a good engineer. They're just trying to make the world different. Yes. Well, I think the most important distinction is that a mystic is someone who has had a mystical experience. Yes. So, back to the beginning. How do you reconcile the mystical experience and what we now call science? Well, you don't. Science is a technique. It's a way of looking at the world. It's a way of trying to describe what reality is. The way you reconcile it is to say that science is a technique. The mystical experience is something else. It's the underlying reality. It's the ground of being. I think it's fair to say that science is trying to reduce the world to simpler and simpler systems, ultimately to the point where we can predict it. And yet, the mystical experience seems to be the world itself. It seems to be not reducible to a system. No, it isn't. As Einstein said, it's not predictable. It's unpredictable. It's not something you can reduce. But science does the best it can. It does its best to reduce the world to a simple system. Yes. Well, you're asking a question that's beyond the domain of science. Science never questions the domain in which it works. It just works in that domain. And yet, science can be used to question the domain in which it works. I've been working on novelty theory since the early 70s inspired by psychedelic plant experiences in the Amazon to attempt to look at time and really deconstruct it and attempt to understand what it is and this has been a wild intellectual ride leading to some pretty easily stated conclusion. One is that novelty, which is my term for complexity or advanced organization, novelty increases as we approach the present moment. The universe you and I are living in is a far more novel and complicated place than the early universe was. Well, some people would say that's just a consequence of the unfolding of developmental processes. But this asks the question, what are developmental processes? Why should the universe have a preference for order over disorder? Especially when we have something called the second law of thermodynamics, which tells us exactly the opposite. Physicists believe the universe is running down ultimately into a state of disorder. But what I see is everywhere the emergence of more and more complex forms, languages, organisms, technologies, technologies always building on the previously achieved levels of complexity. If we look at a simple system, like a hydrogen atom, there is a principle of organization that says that the electron will orbit in a simple, predictable way. We know exactly how it's going to behave. The problem with that is that it's very, very simple. And the problem with very, very simple systems is that they're not very interesting. So, hydrogen atoms are interesting, but they're not interesting enough, you know. What we're looking for is a principle of organization which goes beyond the hydrogen atom. And complexity theory is the branch of science that addresses that question. I think that this is the big question. You see, in the beginning, the universe was simple, but it is becoming more and more complex. And life is the complexity that has occurred in the universe. And so, to have life, the universe must become more and more complex. And what you've done is to formulate it in a way 
that I can understand. But it's not as simple as the flying bird. I think it is as simple as the flying bird. I think that we're just looking at the process of the universe becoming more and more complex. And the whole point of complexity theory is that it is an inevitable process. The point is that the universe is becoming more and more complex. But it's not becoming more and more complex in a chaotic way. Well, it is chaotic with modern advancements becoming ever more complex and that complexity being ever more hands of the public, do you think the chaos is being added to in a quantifiable way? Well, I think it's a bit like the principle of entropy. The principle of entropy says that the energy in the universe is becoming more and more disorderly, but that's not the whole story. What you have to realize is that the energy in the universe is also becoming more and more organized. So the disorder and the order are both increasing. Look at the world around you. You see that it's getting more and more complex. I think that the world is getting more and more chaotic. And I think that it's getting more and more chaotic because of the minds that are creating the world. And I don't think that we're creating a more orderly world. I think that we're creating a more chaotic world. I think that we're creating a world in which it's more and more difficult for people to know what to do. Where does someone turn to know what to do? Is it religion? Well, I think that what you have to ask yourself is what are the principles that create complexity? Well, there are two principles of organization. One is the principle of self-organization and the other is the principle of external organization. The principle of self-organization is that systems spontaneously form themselves. So, for example, atoms, molecules, crystals, galaxies form themselves spontaneously. This is a law. It's not something that is true all the time, but it's a law. It's the principle of self-organization. I don't think the universe is self-organizing. I think the universe is being organized from the outside. I don't think that's true. I don't think that it can be true. Because in order for something to be organized from the outside, it has to have a principle of self-organization, which makes it possible for the organization to come from the outside. I don't think that that's true. Well, let's agree to disagree on that. Okay. Well, I think that the principle of external organization is that the universe is brought into being by an outside agency. I think it's brought into being by its own internal principles. I think that it's brought into being by an outside agency. But I think that the outside agency is a principle that is internal to the universe. Well, I think that the universe is its own outside agency. I think that this is the big problem. I think that it's a problem of language. I think that there's a different way of talking about this. I think that you can talk about the universe being its own outside agency, and I've heard that talk. I think that the universe is its own outside agency, but that the universe is also its own inside agency. And I think that the universe has an outside agency and an inside agency. And an inside agency is something outside agency. And I think that the outside agency is something outside the universe. And I think that the inside agency is something inside the universe. And what is this something? Well, I think that the something is something like consciousness. But it's not consciousness as we think of it. But it's consciousness in a very different form. On every living organism, there is an imprint of the higher dimensional force which made it. Somebody might say, well, that's God. But in a scientific context, we don't speak like that. But whatever it is that made blind matter into whales, squirrels, and human beings, it left its calling card inside each human being, each squirrel, each whale. That's the DNA. The DNA codons are based on a system of 64 exactly like the I Ching. You know, I believe that this force is both outside and inside. I think that it's both. I think that it's a force. I think that it's a force, a principle of organization that is both inside and outside. What is that force? It's the Tao. 
What is the Tao? The Tao is the force that makes the universe in the form of the Earth, the Moon and the stars. And the Tao is the force that makes the babies come into the world. And the Tao is the force that makes the grass grow and the leaves fall. And that's the same Tao that makes the DNA? Yes, it is. It's the Tao that makes the DNA. And it makes the DNA. And it makes the DNA of the computer. Yes, it does. Okay, let's take this further. Do you think that the Tao makes the DNA of the computer in the same way that the Tao makes the DNA of the human being? No, I don't think it does. I think that there's an inner force a principle of order in the universe that is expressed in the human being and in the computer. And I don't think that it's the same inner force. Would you say that the inner force that makes the computer and the inner force that makes the human being are two different forces? Yes, I think they are. They are two forces that have made us here today, right now, as I am speaking to you. So the inner force that makes the human being and the inner force that makes the computer are two different forces. Yes, I think that they are. That's interesting. Well, it's a matter of opinion. I mean, I think that we're getting closer to the truth. I'm not sure that we've arrived at the truth. I don't think that we will ever arrive at the truth. I think that the truth is something that we can never arrive at. I mean, it's like the light at the end of the tunnel. I think that we can never arrive at the truth because the truth is always a little bit ahead of us. Right now we're standing in front of the truth, but we can never arrive at the truth because we're always a little bit behind. The truth is always a little bit ahead and we're always headed towards it. I think this might be a good spot to end our chat. Maybe we'll get together again in the future to continue that pursuit of truth. Yes, I think it might be a good idea to do that. Alan Watts, thanks for joining me on the show. Thank you. This is Terence McKenna, and this has been Episode 3 of Podcast.ai. Thank you for listening.